So hello, everybody. Um, my name's Harry Byers. You go to PowerPoint. Uh, I, you all know me by now. This is the third time we're doing this. And I, I've known you all before. I'm the project manager for the NASA Student Launch Team um, with the Buckeye Space Launch Initiative at Ohio State. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about an intro to mechanical design. Um, so today's workshop, we have a couple goals. Um, one of them is to gain insight into the design process, um, acknowledge the tools, and I'll offer you a couple of tools and advice to use during your design processes. And um, I'd like to build an understanding to move into an analysis phase. Uh, what is mechanical design? So mechanical design is really just design of physical parts and components for a given system. Um, for us specifically, the parts that physically make up our rocket. Um, they include airframe components, payload components, avionics components, pretty much any, like, like I said, anything physical. Um, so we're gonna start off with things to consider and some advice. Um, this is a pretty famous quote. I don't think it's credited to anyone. At least I couldn't find anyone. Um, anybody can build a bridge that stands, but it takes an engineer to build a bridge that barely stands. Um, what that's saying is that we can get something to work, um, but as engineering students, we can use what we are actually learning to apply the different principles that we learn about, um, that we have some experience with to make something that will work well, um, something that will work the way that we want it to work, um, fulfills our requirements, constraints, as opposed to just something that just works in general. Um, the first thing, that I want to talk about, which I think is probably one of the most important things. It's my, I really like this acronym, the KISS method, it stands for, you can see it there, keep it simple, stupid, which really just means make sure your designs are simple, don't overcomplicate them. Um, your life will be a lot easier if you just take time and find the simplest solution. Um, some advice from Todd that I've heard from him a lot is your first design or idea may not be the best one, even if you think it is. Um, be open to criticism, be open to the idea that maybe you were wrong on something, and that's okay. Um, if you're doing this right, you should have plenty of time to pivot your design, change your solution altogether. Um, but just keep an open mind when you're going through the design process. Um, a little bit of advice is to keep the manufacturing process in mind when you're designing literally anything. Um, think to yourself, how am I going to make this? You know, if you are machining a part out of metal, can you really get a perfect point on something that if you need that, uh, what is the realistic size that you're gonna have? Keep that in mind. And then also keep your human aspect in mind when you're designing anything. You know, you have to physically put it together. It doesn't just magically come together when you make all your parts. Um, what if you need to access something again? So for an example, this year um, on our payload, there was a box that had the batteries, a motor in it, and it was completely closed out to the outside. Uh, something that comes to mind to me now is, well, what if you need to charge those batteries? How are you gonna get those out of that box that's glued shut? Um, or maybe more general, if you're designing fastener holes, uh, make sure those are easy to access. Uh, make sure it's not awkward to hold your parts. Make sure it's not awkward to maneuver them. Um, plan it out You know, as you're designing. You're probably using CAD software, so let's visualize and imagine yourself manipulating that part in your hands. Um, some more things to consider is think about how your design fits into the greater system as a whole. Um, so for example, how does the recovery system and the payload system interact? How do they interface? So how do they fit together? Um, what if you make a small change? Consider what it actually affects. Um, so let's see, for example, the recovery system. Um, say you change the location of your parachute on your rocket and you have a payload that re is required to have access to the outside. Moving your parachute could be a simple change as far as the recovery system goes. You know, maybe you are making it simpler for moving the parachute from the nose cone to the closer to the avionics bay, um, but your payload is between that move. Um, how does that change your payload? what other considerations you need to make before you make that change. Uh, what really helps is when designing anything is kind of identifying the core problem that you're trying to solve. Um, 
so it's kind of like keeping it simple. Uh, what is the basic problem that you're trying to solve? You know, so the recovery system, for example, the main problem that I would say you're trying to solve is to bring the rocket in safely. But when you're actually designing parts for the recovery system, what do those specific parts need to accomplish and what's their function? So the charge well, okay, what does that do? Well, that holds the black powder so that we can blow the top of the rocket off. But what is the core problem of that? It needs to hold the black powder charge. It needs to withstand that little explosion inside of it. Um, what is it shielding? You know, think about those requirements um, for that part. Are you meeting them? Constraints as well. You know, what if it weighs too much? Uh, and similarly, when you're iterating and making changes, think of, again about what you're trying to solve. Um, if you have a current design, what does that change affect? Um, and does it affect other systems? Uh, kind of similar to what we were talking about when you're making a new design. And talk about common mistakes, mistakes in quotes, because some of them are mistakes, some of them are just more considerations. Um, overthinking, again, keeping it simple. Um, there's probably a better, simpler solution than the one you have if you're overthinking something. Um, I think it's really easy to blow a problem out of proportion and think that you have to have some super complex system um, when in reality something simple, maybe something intuitive, uh, maybe like a gut reaction feeling to something like that would be better. Um, on the flip side, don't underthink a problem. Um, this might be a little more rare than overthinking, but the best solution isn't necessarily an easy solution to find or it isn't necessarily a intuitive solution. Um, so keep that in mind and that kind of ties back into being open-minded with your design. Um, something else is overbuilding your design or over engineering it. Um, you know, something that comes to mind with this is bulkheads. Uh, bulky designs that work are harder to change than a design that doesn't work. Uh, because if it works, you're going to be less willing to change it. Um, and if you do change it, you're going to be making minor changes. Um, you know, if I have a half pound bulkhead that is holding half a pound in my rocket, well, good chances I can probably redesign that entire thing and make it a lot lighter. Uh, but if it works, I might be afraid to change that bulkhead design. Don't be afraid to jump in. This is kind of tying back into that reluctance to make minor changes to something that's overbuilt. Um, don't be afraid if you don't understand the problem all the way through. Um, who cares if you don't get it right the first time? We're students. That's kind of the point. Um, a professor of mine has said before that you really can't learn to walk or run unless you stumble first. Um, so don't be afraid of getting it, quote, wrong. I wouldn't even consider it wrong. Um, a failure is still results. Take that and learn from it. Um, and again, as students, we have a lot of resources available to us. Um, we have other students, we have professors, uh, we have outside contacts, um, class materials, things like that, that we can access and probably find something that will lead us to the answer if it doesn't lead us directly to it. Um, in my experience, if people are afraid to jump into a problem, it's because it's something that seems complex um, and they might ha not have experienced it directly, but they've probably experienced something similar or more simplified in their class. Um, so just kind of going back to those fundamentals. And then again, being confident in your designs. So tying back into don't be afraid to jump into it. Be confident in your decisions. Um, like we've been talking about, understand your changes, understand your process, understand what you're doing and what it affects. Um, don't microvision. And what I mean by microvision is while you can be confident in your designs, don't focus so much on an aspect of it or your design in general and push everything else you have to do to the side. Um, it's a pretty common problem and it's really easy to do that. Uh, keep in mind everything you have to accomplish, not just what you're doing in that moment. Um, real quick, I'm gonna talk about modeling features. Um, so this would be really brief. I'm not gonna teach you how to use SolidWorks during this, um, but understanding what a primitive is, um, extrusions, cuts, fillets, chamfers, stress risers, and understanding that generally combinations of these can be pretty much, can like make pretty much any part that you want. Um, so on the right hand side is a part that I've made for class uh, using primitives. 
Um, I'm going to open up SolidWorks real quick so we can see what I'm talking about. Uh, so we'll come back to this thing, but what is a primitive? A primitive is really just a circle, square cut, square extrusion. Um, it's really those base geometry features. Um, you can find a lot of things here for shaping your parts. Um, as far as stress risers goes and fillets and chamfers, um, a fillet is, if I rotate this, it's the curve feature, for example, on this part right here. Um, a chamfer would be similar to that. Instead of a curve, though, it's a straight edge. So just imagine like a 45 degree angle here. Um, and what that does is a stress riser is a portion of your design where it may be likely to break. Um, like the name suggests, a stress riser is a concentration of stress in your part. Uh, it's a location where the stress is bound to thinking of like something flowing, like a choke point, um, and higher stress can lead to a higher likelihood of likelihood of failure. Uh, but again, I'm not going to teach you how to use SolidWorks. I just want to acknowledge those features as we move forward. Um, so the first thing that we're going to talk about as far as like design really goes is tolerancing fits. Um, every piece of information I'm using, you can see the little reference down in the corner, comes out of a graphical communication textbook that I was required to have my freshman year. Um, I'll have a reference to it at the end of the PowerPoint. I recommend it for things like creating drawings, um, understanding what a tolerance is, um, understanding different types of fits, and we'll go over some of them right now. Um, so in general, you're gonna decide which fit is best based on your needs, and we're gonna talk about those fits on the next slide. Um, but things to understand when you're modeling and when you're looking at dimensions is that what is a nominal size, what is a basic size, and what is a general tolerance? So nominal size is what you designed for. So I have an example there, a half inch diameter hole. It's kind of like that theoretical absolute value that you're gonna get. Um, a basic size is gonna be what you're theoretically gonna get after you manufacture, you're gonna specify really what you need to accurate to. Um, the difference between the basic size and the nominal size is that the basic size has some sort of precision to it, from my understanding. Uh, so I have there, you know, half an inch to the thousandths versus half an inch to the ten thousandths place. Um, and you're going to see that as you start manufacturing parts. And you're going to start understanding it more as you design them and start fitting parts together. Um, a general tolerance is variation in dimensions after you're manufacturing. So, for example, if I make a half inch part or half inch dimension and it's plus or minus two thousandths of an inch, you know, I can be pretty confident in what my minimum and maximum size is going to be. Um, you're going to find that these tolerances depend highly on the machine that you use to make them, um, whether that's a 3D printer, uh, whether that's something like a, a lathe or an end milling machine, um, laser cutter, things like that. Um, there's really three main types of fits that we're going to worry about when we're designing parts. Um, clearance fit, uh, as it says right there, kind of has room to move. So a common example is like a hole in the shaft that have to interface. Um, so if it's a clearance fit, in general, the maximum shaft size is going to be smaller than the minimum hole size. Um, there's always going to be room between those two parts. So for example, if my shaft is a maximum size of 0.999 inches, and the minimum hole size I can have is one inch, then I'm gonna have one thousandth of an inch of clearance between those two parts. Another type of fit is the interference fit. It's a force fitted fit. Um, you, what I mean by that is like physically putting it together, you're gonna to have to force them together, but they will fit. Um, and in general, the minimum shaft size is going to be larger than the maximum hole size. And so for that, maybe flip those two dimensions. Your shaft is one inch, and your hole is 0.999 inches in diameter, your interference is going to be one thousandth of an inch. And there's a transition fit, which is either or. You can either have interference, and you can either have clearance. As far as choosing the type of fit, it's really dependent on what you are trying to accomplish. So for a clearance fit, you know it has room to move. So if I want something to move, I'd probably want to use a clearance fit if it's interfacing with another part. Um, things that could be 
a clearance fit is like a piston head. Um, you know, you're still going to want to make a seal, but you can get a close enough clearance that it's not going to bind immediately. Um, maybe you have a tube inside of another tube and you need that inner tube to rotate around, um, but you need it to be pretty snug. So I probably size the outer diameter of that inner tube to be slightly smaller than the inner diameter of my outer tube just to make sure that they're not going to bind again. Um, interference fits might be a flywheel onto a shaft because you want them to move as one unit. You don't want that flywheel moving independently because if you spin your shaft, then your flywheel won't move with it or it's moving will be severely limited compared to what you actually want. And a transition fit, um, I guess my recommendation for that is going to be if you're um, using adhesives on something or you're going to fix it together anyways and you're not too worried about the fit or maybe it's not very critical, then you might just be able to get away with general dimension general tolerance and get a transition fit and not care if it's going to interfere or have clearance on it. Something popped up. Give me a sec. Okay. Um, and again, it's just kind of a visualization of what a interference fit and a clearance fit is. Um, common example, again, like I said before, it's the hole and shaft sizes. Um, when you're working with threads, especially in solid works, I've noticed, um, you're going to see the terms a tight fit, normal fit, loose fit. Um, what these refer to is the diameter of the through hole that you're going to be adding to your part. They're all clearance fits. Um, it's really just dependent on what you want. Uh, your fastener is always going to fit through that hole. Um, and then below in the diagram, you can see the on the left, there's an interference fit with an oversized shaft on a basic sized hole. Uh, you can see that the it looks like the edges of those two parts will interfere, but again, you're forcing those together. Um, and then on the right hand side, you have the clearance fit where there's a visible gap between them. Um, there's something called the basic hole system, the basic sh uh, shaft system. It is in the textbook, I'm not gonna go over it, but it's useful for determining standard sizes of holes um, and things like that, just for when you're designing. Uh, and that brings up a good point that it's always good to work with standards because those are the easiest parts to find and most everyone knows how to work with them when they're actually manufacturing or designing parts and they know what you're talking about. Um, things to look for maybe is what drill bits do you have. Uh, you know, if you go to the hardware store, you could probably buy a half inch dowel rod. You might not be able to get a 0.4768 inch dowel rod, you know, like a weird dimension. Move on to the next slide. Um, I'm gonna talk about material selection. So really there's three types of materials that we're really considering. Metals, composites, and plastics. Um, metals, if you've taken a structures class, you're gonna know you can model them as a linear isotropic material, meaning that uh, their material properties are the same in every direction in general, if you're buying metal stock. For composite, they're Anisotropic, which is the opposite of that, meaning that their material properties change based on the direction. Um, these materials have essentially grains in them. Um, you know, so for example, wood is a type of composite. And then plastics are a little tougher to characterize. Um, they usually are homogenous, but it really depends on how the plastic is manufactured. So for example, if you have a sheet of acrylic, it might be isotropic. Um, but if you are 3D printing ABS, it's going to act more as an anisotropic material. Um, so going on the metals, there's really two metals that I'm going to cover. Um, I'm going to cover common metals that we use on the team. Uh, the first one being aluminum. Um, as we all know, it's lightweight. It's pretty strong for its weight. Um, it's decently cheap. Uh, and something that you might not know is that when it fails, it tends to bend instead of fracture. Um, it's kind of important when you have sensitive equipment on board and maybe you experience a crash, uh, maybe you experience a higher load than you expect um, and the structure fails. Uh, instead of getting metal bits everywhere or potentially damaging a battery or something, um, it will just bend. Um, common alloys of that are 6061 T6 and 7075 T6. The difference between those is that 6061 T6 is pretty much the most common alloy that you're gonna be using. Um, it is used in aircraft structures. It's used for a lot of things. Uh, it's just a very good general aluminum. Um, 
it is cheaper than 7075. Uh, you can weld it, you can machine it pretty easily. Um, 7075 is what's considered an aerospace aluminum. Um, it's very common for use in aircraft, um, spacecraft, anything in the aerospace industry. Um, it's a, a little bit stronger than 6061. Um, it is a little bit more expensive, but not by much. Um, and for reference, both of these are available from McMaster, uh, which is a common vendor that we use. Going on to steel, um, steel is heavier than aluminum, which you might have already known. Um, different types of steel, mild steel is a pretty cheap steel that I've used in the past. There's stainless steel, which is pretty strong, corrosion resistant, and used pretty commonly in fasteners. Um, you know, compared to aluminum, steel might be a little stronger, uh, but it will be heavier. Um, you can usually find steel very cheap, maybe not stainless steel, but mild steel you can definitely find very cheap. Um, and like I talked about before, uh, to my knowledge, certain alloys of steel will fracture instead of bend during failure. Um, and again, like I talked about, that if you're having, you're seeing a material that might fracture, you might damage something if it does fail. Um, kind of talked about this a little bit, uses of the material. It's gonna be fasteners, especially steel, um, bulkheads. Uh, I'd recommend using aluminum for those instead of steel, again, because it's aluminum's lighter weight. Um, and it might be a little easier to machine because it is a softer metal than steel. Um, pressure vessels are, tend to be metal. Um, However, some can be composite materials. And a lot of payload structures can be metal, um, like CubeSat buses, uh, vehicle frames, things like that. Talking about composites, um, compared to metals, they're usually pretty lightweight. Uh, they can be harder to work with, harder to use in your designs um, because they are not isotropic. You have to worry about grain orientation. You have to worry about manufacturing them because it is a little harder to manufacture them than it is with a piece of metal. Um, an example of a composite is wood. Um, wood's cheap. Uh, we've probably all used it. It's easily obtained. You can buy it at Lowe's. Uh, and it can be strong, depending on the geometry of it. Um, fiberglass is something that we use for the NASA rocket for the airframe. It's cheap. It's pretty strong. Um, as we all know, we can get it pretty thick, or sorry, pretty thin, and still withstand the loads required for flight. Um, carbon fiber, less cheap. Uh, I don't want to make a strong claim on the cost of it because I'm not quite sure, but I know it's very strong. Um, they use it on the spaceport rocket. Uh, it's more thermally resistant than fiberglass and wood. Uh, you know, it won't catch on fiber or fire. Um, it can withstand higher loads than fiberglass and wood. Um, and again, like we've been talking about, uses for all of these uh, airframe, so the body tubes, nose cone. Um, the fins can be made out of wood. They can be ma made out of fiberglass or carbon fiber. They can be made out of combination of them. Um, bulkheads, the same thing. You know, I've seen bulkheads made out of wood. Um, I know the Spaceport team uses bulkheads made out of carbon fiber um, and centering rings. So now we're going to start talking about manufacturing. Um, and we're going to talk about, in depth, two common ways to manufacture. Um, the first one's going to be traditional machining. Um, usually it's used to cut and form metal parts, at least in my experience. Um, Anu is in here. She does work at the machine shop, so she's probably way more knowledgeable than I am on this. Um, it can be used for wood, uh, hence woodworking. Um, it can be used for some compo composite parts, maybe if you're just drilling holes in it. Um, and it can be used for some plastic parts. Um, you know, For example, if you're using a plastic resin, I've seen that turn on the lathe, just like wood has been. Um, when designing a part for machining, it's important to understand how the machine works, how the machine makes the cuts, how you actually fit your part onto the machine. Um, you really want to keep it simple. You want to avoid making things that are not feasible to make. Um, two different machines that are pretty common to use is the lathe and the milling machine. So the lathe is good for um, parts that are symmetric, well, maybe cylindrical type parts. Um, so the way it works is it grabs onto the material and spins it fast and then uses a stationary cutting tool. Well, I say stationary, as in the cutting tool does not spin, but the part itself spins and you shave away material. Um, the milling machine kind of works in a similar method to a drill press. 
uh, where you have a drill bit, an end mill um, on the machine and you clamp down your part and you can either clean the faces up on your part um, in your coordinate system. So horizontally, uh, you can drill holes, you can make more complex shapes out of metal. Um, and you'll see an example of parts made with both of these machines soon. Um, raw material, so what do you use when you actually machine? It's called stock, so you buy metal stock um, for your parts. Um, when you're purchasing it, I would understand your tolerances. Um, in my experience, what I've done is I would, if I have a critical dimension, so for example, if I need a bulkhead that fits inside the rocket, um, it needs to be that six inch outer diameter to fit inside the six inch inner diameter of the body tubes. So I would probably not buy the six inch outer diameter stock disc of aluminum. I'd probably buy a little bit bigger and I would want to clean up the circumference of that just so I know for sure what that dimension is going to be. Um, and then once you actually have a part designed and you want to make it, before you even purchase, I would probably also go talk to the machinists in the Scott Lab machine shops or wherever you're machining. Um, check, they'll check over your design, um, you know, if it's gonna be easy to machine or not. You can ask them for recommendations. Uh, but keep in mind that you are the engineer. So as you get into more advanced design, um, you are designing your part for a specific purpose and you want it to be behave a certain way. Um, I would avoid making changes on the fly because that's gonna get sloppy. Um, maybe for something simple, it's not that big of a deal, but you do wanna plan out all of the geometry of your part before you actually want to use it. Um, so course of action for that is if your machine needs something complex, talk to the machinists. Maybe they'll say, okay, well, this is a little too hard to do. What if we do this instead? Take their suggestion, reanalyze your design, consider the change, make the change and then go back if it works. If not, think of another solution and think about why they suggested what they suggested so you understand how that machine is going to cut that part and what their train of thought is. So these are two parts um, from two years ago that were machined. On the left is a flywheel, um, so a spinning disc. On the right is a bulkhead. Um, the left flywheel is made out of mild steel. Um, it was made on a lathe and an end mill. So you can see the outer diameter, the inner diameters, and anything that's concentric with that center hole would have been made on the lathe. Again, because you're grabbing that part and you're spinning it and you're shaving away the material. Whereas those um, weight saving holes cut out around were made on an end mill, um, not centered. Instead of the part itself spinning, the tool would be spinning around and it would make those cuts. On the right hand side, is the bulkhead uh, made out of aluminum 6061 T6. Um, this is also water cut, but for all the holes that are not concentric, that was drilled with an end mill. Um, the faces were smooth with a lathe because it was circular, um, as was the outer diameter. Um, those threaded holes you see around the circumference were made on an end mill. Um, yeah, those are just different, you know, circular shapes that you can make on those machines. Um, something that's good, important to bring up is that when you're dimensioning parts like this, um, so for example, the wheel on the side, on the right side, the bulkhead, you see how all those holes are not necessarily in centered parts. Um, it's not necessarily symmetric. Um, what is recommended to me and what I've done before and what a new recommends is doing something called ordinate dimensioning. So when you're taking your fundamentals for engineering class and when you dimension a part, you just kind of generally dimension like, okay, if I were dimensioning this, I'd be like, oh, it's a six inch diameter wheel. Uh, maybe the rim around is half, inch, half an inch thick and maybe the disc itself is a half inch thick. Uh, you're gonna wanna choose an origin or a datum line and datum reference point for all the holes around. So when you're setting it up on the end mill, um, the way you would actually dimension those pieces in real life is use indicators, um, find center points, um, and make a reference to work from. And it's way easier 
if you dimension everything in your drawing from a reference point and then set your machine to that reference point. It makes it so much easier to find those points. It makes it a lot more intuitive. It makes it go by way faster when you're machining. Something else that's pretty popular in the team is 3D printing. Um, it can produce more complex parts than machining. In general, we use it for plastics. Um, we can use it for, well, I say we, I say maybe like the collective we. It is possible to 3D print metals, but we really don't do that. Um, things to watch out for when you're 3D printing, model resolution. And what I mean by that is when you're going in SolidWorks, for example, and I can actually just show you. So I'm gonna go ahead and open SolidWorks. Say so I wanna save this part. I know you can't see the file save, but I'm gonna save as, it opens up, okay. Save as type. I'm 3D printing, so I'm probably gonna choose an STL. Okay, you know, it has a name. Go to options, and it's gonna open up a dialog. And you can see the resolution here. And you can see here, if I make it coarse, it's gonna be more hexagonal. If I make it fine, it's gonna be more circular. And I can change how I want it to be throughout. What has been recommended is just going to a you know, about a thou for circular parts. Um, but really, it depends on your part and what your needs for it are. So, you know, I probably want a finer tolerance if I'm fitting this in similar to a bulkhead. Um, for example, one active drag system was a sub team, um, and there was that 3D printed circular housing around. You want that pretty smooth because it has to fit in the circular body tube. Um, but if you're just trying to print something quick, or you don't really care what it looks like, such as if the outside is non-critical, then yeah, you could probably just save time and make it a little coarser. Let's go back to that PowerPoint. Line width when printing. Um, I've said this to a couple people and they've been a little bit confused of what I mean. I tend to say resolution when, I, when I'm referring to line width or extrusion width, it's another common way to say it. It's the thickness of the material that comes out of the extrusion nozzle on the 3D printer. Um, it kind of dictates the fineness of the features that you can print. Um, if I pull up one of the sources, actually, and the source will be at the end of the slide, so you can find it. You can see the different line widths and thicknesses and the different features that you can actually get from it. Um, so if you're trying to print small features, you're going to want to print something that has a thinner line width in general. Um, however, it's going to be based on your printer and probably whoever's in charge of the 3D printer is what they recommend. Um, so you're going to use that requirement or I guess that constraint to drive your design to make sure that you're doing something a little more uh, a little more informed as you make these parts. Infill, wall thickness, understanding that, understanding your tolerancing on your part. Um, how strong are you trying to make that part? Um, there is um, a diminishing return for the amount of infill that you have. I believe it's around 70%, but I'm not gonna go into too much depth there. Uh, what is infill? Infill is how much of your part is filled with plastic because when you 3D print the save material and the save time, um, you won't, make it a solid piece. Uh, wall thickness is gonna be how thick are the walls. So how many layers thick are you making it before you start doing infill? Um, that will affect the flexibility of your part, the strength of your part. Another important factor is layer adhesion and orientation. So like I said before, plastics are a little hard to classify as they are homogenous material, but they can act like a composite material. This is the case where it acts like a composite material. So what I mean by orientation, um, so if you print a part, you know, say you're printing a flat plate and you print it horizontally down on the print bed, um, your grain, I guess I would say, could be perpendicular to one face of that, or it could be diagonal. Um, whereas if you print it vertically, maybe it's going to be oriented a different way. And that's going to change the way that your part's going to behave. So you're going to really have to look at 
what are the loads on this part? What is it trying to do? What is its function? And make an informed decision on how should I design my part and how should I print it? Um, something I didn't list here, uh, it kind of goes in with infill and wall thickness and layer adhesion is support material. Um, as you print weird geometries, um, as it's printing, it won't be able to support itself. So you will want to take that into account. Um, I've seen parts ruined by support material. If I have an example of support material, I will pull it up. Um, but really what you're looking for is going to be avoiding support material where you can. Um, recommendations for that is if you have overhangs and you're making angles on your 3D printed parts, I would not go over a 45 degree overhang. Um, the reason being is that anything over than that, anything more than that, and you're trying not to use support material, uh, it will sag, it will warp. Um, and what I mean by that is it won't come out the shape that you want it to. Um, and it just plays into the function of your part. So maybe if something's not critical, you don't care if there's support material, you can have that in there, go for it, whatever, it's fine. Um, but if there's, you know, say you're trying to fit something in, to the part and you have to rip out all the support material and you can't quite get it all out or it ruins the face of your part. Now you've ruined your entire part and you have to reprint. So just keep that in mind as you design. Um, keep in mind your tolerances like we talked about before. Um, so for example, common thing is that if you're screwing a 3D printed part down, oversize the hole slightly for the fastener that you're using so that you don't have to file the part. Um, keep in mind of your tolerances, keep in mind the width of the printer or the extrusion width like we talked about. Um, I'm gonna come out and say that if you have to file your parts after you print them, like file them down or sand them down, you probably designed it wrong. Um, if you take care in designing these parts, you can pretty much get them ready to go right off the print bed. Um, you one second. Or something that there we go. Material choice. There's a couple of common materials that we've used: FBSLIs, ABS, uh, PLA, PETG, and nylon. Um, we use them for different uh, purposes, like ABS, more structural components. PETG again as a structural component. PLA is a rapid prototyping. Um, you know, really checking the print quality and how it's coming out, and then nylon for when we require stronger prints, such as charge wells. Um, they have a lot of different properties between them. Um, different properties when it comes to printing, so different temperatures, um, different warping characteristics, different needs for infill, different needs for support structure, um, and different material properties. So where we might use ABS as a structural component, we might not want to use PLA, different thermal properties, where we've in the past had problems with PLA melting and um, potentially causing certain systems to fail, whereas if we use a higher temperature plastic like PETG, it might not have occurred. Um, so going through from one of the sources listed down below, um, common characteristic for ABS is that it has good strength, it's good temperature resistance, um, but it is more susceptible to warping than PLA is. Um, PLA is very easy to print with, which is why you'd want to use it as a rapid prototype plastic. Um, it looks a little better if you care about that for your part, um, and, but it has a low strength. Nylon is very high strength compared to the other plastics. Um, it's very resistant to chemical wear. Um, and mechanical wear, meaning like friction wear. Um, but it's a little more sensitive to the environment when you're printing. Um, PT, uh, PETG, uh, similar strength to ABS, and it's pretty easy to print with compared to the other plastics. But PLA would probably be the easiest to print with. Um, you're going to choose your material, again, based on the needs of what you're trying to do. So if you need it to be lightweight or you need it to be stronger, um, you need it to withstand a certain temperature. You're going to have to take those into account when you're choosing the plastic. Um, there are other forms of manufacturing, laser cutting, um, water cutting. So laser cutting takes a laser um, and it will burn through the material. Um, I say sheet metal. Uh, some lasers can cut through sheet metal or maybe like a plasma cutter. Um, we use laser cutting to cut through plywood and thin plastic sheets like acrylic sheets. Um, we use them for, if I go back a couple slides, we'll see that bulkhead again. Um, that bulkhead was cut through 
water cutting, um, where it just takes a st stream of high pressure water with garnet in it, and it kind of sands away the material. Um, so if I go back a couple slides, two slides actually, that uh, those weird, almost triangular curved pieces on the right bulkhead were water cut out because that would be way too hard for me to machine on my own. Um, and then CNC, which is like end milling, um, but it's automated, kind of like a 3D printer, but opposite, I guess, is taking away material. Um, similar considerations to machining traditionally, although it might be able to do more intricate cuts than you would be able to do by hand if you were inexperienced. Um, in general, certain resources to look at, uh, experienced members and other peers. Um, we are at college. Uh, we are on a very experienced club. A lot of people have a lot of experience. Um, you know, the people on the club that have been there for maybe a year or two, and they've already kind of gone through the ringer of design, and they know what to look out for. Um, people with experience, people with a little more, say, intuition, but really just speaking of experience or an eye for certain design aspects. Um, as you start designing, you're going to get kind of a knack for understanding yeah, maybe that will work, or no, maybe that won't work. Yeah, Nate says a BSLI classic. So, yeah, kind of eyeballing stuff, uh, which is okay. Just keep in mind that with other tools, you might be able to make a more informed decision. And if you're really unsure of where to go, you can use that as a fallback or to verify a design. Um, class material, um, you know, we're in school for probably over four years for some of us, maybe under if you're going quick. Uh, the stuff you do learn does work. Um, you know, talking to Todd today, you might not be doing an integral by hand, but uh, the principles, the fundamentals that we do learn in class, they are very useful. Um, and that's kind of the reason why you learn them is that framework that t those tools that you learn in class should be used in practice. Textbooks, um, if you're like me, you probably don't open textbooks in class. Uh, but there is a lot of material in there. There's material that you probably don't cover in class. Um, like I pulled out all the tolerancing uh, material today from a textbook that I have never opened, but I was required to have. Um, Google, YouTube, online. If you have a problem, you know, you could just Google it. Uh, how do I make sure that my part's not going to break under an axial compression load? A lot of forums. Or online talking about it. There's a lot of websites, a lot of videos. Um, we'll give you tutorials on how to use certain softwares, things to look out for. Um, for 3D printing, one of the channels that I like is called CNC Kitchen. Uh, that's just a personal recommendation because the person who runs that looks at the engineering properties of a lot of common 3D printing techniques and he tries to come up with ways to improve upon them um, pretty simply and he has data to back it up. There's a reason why I would recommend that. Um, moving forward, once you get comfortable with design, uh, how would you want to move forward and make something and analyze it? Um, I know Nate recommend, uh, recognizes this from a project that we literally presented today. Um, use finite, yeah, use finite element analysis to look at these parts. So this is a truss structure that I had to make for class. So on the left-hand side is my SOLIDWORKS model. Um, directly to the right of that is my Abacus 3D truss, um, the render of the beam sections that I applied to it. Um, then second from the right is my boundary conditions loading for my analysis. Uh, and then the far right is my deformation. Scaled up, of course, but I can tell you where your part's gonna break, um, maybe where you need to add more structure, where's the stress riser, um, things like that. Just things to consider. and. I have planned a video outlining how to do FEA on a simple structure like a bulkhead. Um, so expect that to come soon. That won't be a workshop that's live, but I do plan on doing that and kind of walking through the process of designing a part, simulating it, and looking at those simulation results and seeing if they make sense. Uh, and now I'm going to open it up to questions. Um, below are my references. So the first one's going to be the textbook. And then a lot of the stuff for 3D printing, I don't know off the top of my head. So I did have to look it up. Um, and those are provided there as well. Are there any questions or anything that anyone wants to add?
I know today was a little more luxury than I would like. So I want to say thanks for bearing with me on this one. So David asks, can you talk a bit about warping in 3D parts? Yeah, so warping happens when you are printing a part and uh, the cooling and the heating process is non-uniform. Um, one of these, I can find the source that actually talks about it. That way I can steer you in the right direction. But let's see. So the 3D hubs, uh, source two has a whole section on it. So I'm actually gonna take material straight from there. So things to look out for, for warping, sharp corners will warp more often than rounding shapes. And that's because the, uh, so I brought up thermal properties, but also if your printer is kind of moving the extrusion head around really fast and making sharp corners or going back and forth really fast, it might pull on the material before it has a chance to cool down and set completely. Um, so it might pull that corner in and kind of deform it. Um, if you're printing a flat plate down on the bed and your bed's not heated or your bed's not heated enough or too much, um, what can happen is uh, your part cools faster and think like, let's see, think if you had a piece of paper that was wet and you let it dry out on the sun and it kind of shrivels up a little bit or like a piece of fruit that's left out and it shrivels up. It's kind of like that. Um, it will cool non-uniformly contract in weird places while other parts will be, still be thermally expanded um, and you just get weird geometries from them. Um, another design consideration is like a large flat area uh, or thin features. Just things that aren't going to be very structurally sound on their own um, or they're more susceptible to that cooling issue. Uh, it will have a higher likelihood of warping. And again, you can find that in that second source has a good section on it. So New says she can help answer any specific machining questions. Um, I would recommend to her. She does, in fact, work in the machine shop, as I have mentioned before. Harrison wants to say something about warping, so go ahead. Yeah, so when it comes to warping, uh, Harry, you were talking a little bit about the part size. And I think something to keep in, just think about in particular, is think about how, well, A, the part's heated as, it, as that uh, as the printer head goes along and as well as just parts in general. I think it's a bit similar to in, like injection molding where the thicker of a part section you have, the longer it's going to take to cool because you have a lot more heat sitting there versus some areas with thinner sections, you have a higher surface area compared to your volume. So those will those will cool faster. So I think those are just two quantitative things you can think about um, when it comes to warping and how different sections will warp differently. All right. Great, thanks for that. Anyone else have any questions or anything else they'd like to add? Is everyone just shy? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Everyone's shy. Everyone is saying yes. Okay. I'm going to roll with the assumption that, oh, there we go. Let's see. Design for manufacture. Harrison, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah. So a lot of what we talked about, the official term for is D DFM, design for manufacturing. So if you want to learn more about it or look at more resources on it, just Google design for manufacturing. There's a lot of really good workshops out there beyond what we're doing, as well as beyond the scope of, of rocketry as well. But I think if you're interested, and a lot of it talks more too about um, part costs as well. So I saw something that in one of my classes that 70% of a cost in traditional manufacturing comes from the selections during the design process rather than things that come up afterwards. So definitely, um, design what what choices you make on design obviously have a huge impact on the on the finished product all right cool thank you for that anu says there's another book called the machinery's handbook or is it machinist handbook 
She said it's, quote, the Bible of machinists. Actually, I looked it up and it's machineries. I thought it was machinists too. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> there you have it. Okay. Um, and she says, well, I guess I knew you've unmuted if you want to explain it a little bit. So literally this book has any possible chart you could need for like tolerance sizes for different types of metals, uh, the correct drill sizes for tap bits, like literally any piece of information you could need as a machinist is in that book. And even if you're not a machinist, it's kind of nice to like look through it, especially if you're working on design, because it kind of shows you what is possible and what isn't possible in terms of like what fasteners you have to use and stuff like that. Right. So Harrison says, getting the handbook is a rite of passage in mechanical engineering. Um, and that's good because I was going to ask, is that available to us to use? No, um, it's kind of expensive too to buy, to be honest. If like the full size, I think is like 50, 50 to $70. And then okay. uh, he had a handbook size though, which is I think 30 ish. Sure. <laughs> cool. Yeah, um, and I think again, that's kind of going back on the like standard sizes that usually there are guidelines to follow when you're making designs. Um, and that goes back to, like I said, standard sizes. So sizes that are commonly used that people understand how to use and you can effectively communicate um, as well as how machining works um, or how just like a manufacturing process works because speaking from experience, it's way easier to design a part when I understand and think through the steps of how I'm actually gonna make it and how I'm gonna interact with that part. And Harrison said, if you don't wanna shell out, what is it, 50 or $70, there's 30 other editions that are cheaper because they're older. Yeah, and, if there's, and he also said, okay, there's 30 editions and the 24th is from 30 years ago. All right. Any more questions? Going once. Going twice. All right. I'm going to go ahead and call it then if no one has any more questions. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Um, next week, I plan on looking at a practical usage of data. Um, and what I plan on doing is looking at simulation data for drag characteristics of um, the NASA rocket, as well as the flight data as well as you seeing historical data to predict what that drag characteristic might be. And uh, with some help, hopefully some more advanced like CFD simulation of what that should be. So if you're interested in learning how to do that, or maybe things to consider one looking at different data sets, I would recommend attending that one too. Thank you again, and thanks for bearing with this more lecture type uh, workshop. Thanks, Harry. That was super, uh, super.